Good morning. We could all be seated. It's 9 a.m. and I'd like to call the Health Sciences Committee meeting to order, please. Thank you, everyone. It's 9 a.m. Winter, would you please take roll for the Health Sciences Committee? Chair Goodman? Here. Vice Chair Del Carlo? Here. Regent Breger? Here. Regent Perkins? Here. Regent Tarkanian? You do have a quorum. Thank you. I'd like to move to agenda item one. Uh, first off, for those who would like to call in and offer public comment, please dial 669-444-9171 and enter the meeting ID 928-4944-5069 and passcode 555-555. Is there any public comment at Great Basin? No public comment in Elko. Thank you. Is there any public comment at the system office in Reno? <laughs> None in Reno. I'm sorry, is there any public comment? No, there's not in Reno. Thank you. Is there any public comment uh, here at DRI? Hello, my name is Robbie Voper. I am the president of the Associated Students of the University of Nevada School of Medicine, which is this fee collecting uh, chancellor approved student government that represents the medical students at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. Um, recently, our uh, student association has taken it upon ourselves to join NSA. We've been somewhat disconnected, um, and I think there's been sort of a vagueness as how are medical students represented to the regents, to the University of Nevada Reno, um, we are not represented by the GSA as medical students. We have our own student government. And so because of that, I've decided that it's really important that we get plugged in to the other student leaders and to the regents, that the Board of Regents as a whole. Um, we've now been granted a seat, which I think was done a couple months ago. Uh, and because of that, the president of our student government will be able to come and attend regents meetings to advise. I think this is a blessing. It's a really great opportunity. I'm a strong advocate for professional student representation to the Board of Regents, to Nevada, the state of Nevada as a whole. There's a lot of pressing issues that are affecting medical students in particular. I'm sure there are some that are affecting dental students and law students as well, but per pertaining to this committee, I think getting uh, more graduate medical uh, education opportunities is really essential to keeping physicians in the state of Nevada. I personally want to stay here and there really aren't programs that fit my future goals. And so that's something that I wanted to bring to your all attention. Um, furthermore, uh, I think that student representation of medical students is fairly lacking overall across the board. Um, UNLV uh, medical students um, sort of are represented through their GPSA on campus, and I'm not really sure the communications that they have with Central Campus. The medical school at UNR, in many ways, is sort of separate from the rest of UNR as a whole in our governance. We had a really great conversation with our vice dean, or myself and several other student leaders, pertaining to um, fee increases that are coming for our tuition for the medical school. However, there are several fees that are governed by main campus committees that have no medical student representatives on them. So when, when the school decides to change counseling fees or the student health center fee, there's no, there's no avenue for students right now to advocate from the medical school to those committees. There's a graduate student representative and an ASUN representative, so undergrads and grads, but no, no medical students. So I, I really think that these things need to change. I've reached out, um, you know, I've, I've had a hard time getting a hold of uh, central campus committees um, I think that it's sort of this awkwardness of people not really understanding on main campus that our student government exists and that we want to represent ourselves. Um, and I'm looking forward to future campus partnership, medical school partnership, and partnership with the Board of Regents to um, see medical students and professional students in the state of Nevada strive. 
Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like to get a hold of me, I'm happy to meet with you and chat with you about some of your concerns. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Um, SES, is there anybody uh, with public comment on the phone? There is none at this time, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving forward, uh, we will uh, look at the minutes. Um, is there any discussion on the minutes? Yes, Regent Del Carlo. No, I don't have any discussion, but I will make a motion to approve the minutes as Thank written. Thank you. Do we have a second? Susan Brager, second. Thank you. Um, can we vote for approval, please? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, uh, Chair's report. I just wanted to give a brief report. Uh, I'm very excited to be chairing the Health Sciences Committee. I'm looking forward to doing some great things. I'd like this to be a working committee and do some, uh, some, some tackle some issues that we're facing in our state. And I just wanted to let um, this group know that I intend on creating, um, I'm not sure exactly how we can do it. We have to work within our policy, but I, I'm looking to create a group that um, is consistent of community members as well as uh, individuals with the academic medical schools uh, where we can actually pursue uh, GMEs here in our state. I think it's vital that we get more residencies here in the state of Nevada. And so I uh, am going to make that a priority uh, moving forward as chair of this committee. And um, I, uh, since it's my first meeting, I'll just keep it at that, but uh, I'm excited to be here and to chair this. Thank you. Um, all right, item number four, uh, we have Dean Kahn, if you'd like to come up and give us the School of Medicine report for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Medical School. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. For the record, Mark Kahn, K-A-H-N. I'm the Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the Kirk Kerkorian School of Medicine at UNLV. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Regents, um, Presidents, uh, colleagues, I'm happy to present today um, uh, about our school. If I could have my next slide, that would be great. Maybe I'm... Ah, there we go. So the themes that I want to um, get across today and things that we are really working together, both uh, my colleague and friend Paul Houtman, who you're going to hear from in a minute, the dean at UNR, and James Ma, the dean at the dental school, you know, we are working together to really improve access to care for all of our citizens. And we've been working on ideas and plans for how to do that better. Collaboration is key. We're a big state. We're a rural state with a lot of needs. Uh, partnerships are absolutely critical with our hospital partners. And uh, just earlier in the week, uh, the CEO at UMC and I uh, went uh, to Reno to meet with my colleague and friend, Dr. Houtman, and the CEO of Renown to talk about how we can do things together, how, can, how we can do things better and bigger for our state and how we can learn from each other. And finally, as a new school, you know, we continue uh, to grow. And that's an another important theme that I want to get across. So I'm going to start with undergraduate medical education. So in the medical school world, undergraduate means medical school. Graduate is the residency program. So a little bit different uh, than how we see this um, sort of at uh, the university level. But, um, you know, this year we had our white coat ceremony when we welcome our students to the clinical rotations. That was in the end of June. Match day is March 15th. So for anyone in the room who wants to attend, if you live in the South, our match day is going to be in our medical education building. It starts at 9 o'clock. That's when we're legally allowed to read names. But we actually probably start at about 8.30. I welcome all of you, especially the regents. I know some of the regents in the room have been to prior match days. And I'm sure my colleague, Dr. Houtman, will invite you to his if you happen to be in the north. We also have our commencement on May 3rd. Our graduation speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Young from the Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, this year, we had 1,736 applicants for 66 spots. That's an 11% increase from last year. Uh, we had 225 of those were Nevada residents. We uh, interviewed almost 200 people, and we accepted our largest class to date. That's 66 students. Um, 
we also, um, uh, and, and we've already admitted as a time, at the time of these slides, 33 students for next year. That's actually higher than that now. And classes for us begin the end of July. So we remain um, a popular school and we remain committed to caring for this community. So Nevada residents is what we look for because we want people to eventually practice here. The uh, accreditation uh, body for medical schools is the Liaison Committee for Medical Education. That's made up from representation of the AMA and the Association of American Medical Colleges. Actually, our accreditation visit is in October. They just moved it. And I know my colleague, uh, Dr. Houtman, their accreditation is the same year. So we're in the same cycle. So we'll be collaborating together to uh, give our, each other pointers. Um, every year, seniors uh, across the country in medical school uh, do a graduation questionnaire, and I'm happy that 92.1% of our medical graduates are agreed or strongly agreed with being over, overall satisfied with the quality of, the, of their medical education as compared to the national average of 89.4. So we you know, retain and uh, continue to have satisfied students. Uh, again, graduate medical education, those were our residents. We started a new primary care internal medicine residency track with the VA. We've hired our own disability specialist to help work with our residents. Uh, we started a forensic pathology fellowship, and we're in the process of rec recruiting our first trainees. We also started a forensic psychiatry fellowship. And what happened after the slides were submitted is we just got uh, a accreditation of our rheumatology fellowship. That will be the only rheumatology fellowship training program in the state in a specialty where wait times can be sometimes nine to 12 months. So we really need rheumatologists and we are going to uh, start training rheumatologists. And uh, this was really initiated by a generous grant from a donor and we'd like to recognize them uh, anonymously as well. Um, we uh, have our, our, our residents continue to be active in scholarship. Uh, they've presented at 19 different professional societies. We're working to, with uh, our primary partner, UMC, to expand graduate medical education. And you know, since our new building has a cadaver lab, we hosted our first uh, interdisciplinary multi-specialty cadaver lab for the residents in surgical disciplines to practice on cadavers. And that was held in October. From a research perspective, this gets confusing. We're a new school, but suffice it to say that we continue to increase our research expenditures annually. Suffice it also to say that we have a long way to go. Uh, we're in the process of hiring some basic scientists uh, in, con in conjunction with the School of Science to really forward our research missions in basic science. We also continue to submit more and more grants proposals. Our clinical trials, a number of active trials is small, but continues to grow. And we recognize that that's an area for great growth. We have uh, recently hired a relatively senior rheumatologist, and he's going to bring a number of clinical trials. Um, and uh, we're working with the rest of our faculty to do the same. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is a key uh, part uh, of everything that we do, and it really holds all of our missions together. We run a series of pipeline programs and pre-college enrichment programs. We have nine student identity organizations. Uh, and, and I want to tell you, uh, over the past year, uh, we have hosted a regional uh, student national medical uh, uh, student association uh, meeting. That was great. President Whitfield uh, gave one of the initial uh, addresses. That was really well received. And this Saturday, uh, we're going to host the National Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association Conference. So this is really an important part of what we do. Um, Again, we, we host workshops and um, uh, really nothing to add on that. So development and, and uh, fundraising, um, we're working uh, with our brand new alumni chapter. Again, we're about to graduate our um, fourth class. So um, we don't have that many alums, but we have some. And um, we're continuing to work with donors. Recently this week, we got a promise for uh, about a two and a half million dollar gift and we continue to raise money to support our various missions. Um, we uh, have two endowed chairs now and we are going to host an investiture 
uh, for those. That's a chair in ob and a chair in orthopedics. The regents will be invited to uh, that event, and we use our white coat uh, as an opportunity to fundraise as well. UNLV Health, that's our practice plan. That's a clinical part of what we do. Uh, we've opened a new uh, gynecologic surgery and obstetrics clinic, uh, which is going to focus on uh, maternal health. And we've also really stepped up our recruitment efforts. These are old numbers, but we're rapidly hiring clinical faculty. We recently hired a new uh, chair for uh, gynecological surgery and obstetrics, Dr. David Jackson. And financially, um, I just learned uh, the practice plan to date is in the black, uh, about two and a half million dollars. We also had uh, uh, an audit as we do annually by Grant Thornton. We had a clean audit with no material weaknesses. So we're really uh, hoping to continue because that helps fund our many missions. Uh, we've, uh, again, uh, last year saw over 151,000 patients and performed uh, almost 90,000 surgeries and hospital visits. So again, we're in the community. We're caring for people. This is important. We also, not mentioned in a slide, uh, have clinics now in two under Serve schools in uh, Las Vegas. That's really important. That's an important part of our mission. And the kids in these schools otherwise would not be getting any care. So what I want to show you again, collaboration is key. I'd like to publicly call out my friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Houtman. It's been really great working with you, Paul, uh, over the past year and a half or so. And I look forward to seeing what we're going to be able to do together. Um, and then uh, growth and access to care are really our key issues. So I thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Kahn, Regent Del Carlo? Thank you, Chair Goodman. And I really don't have a question, but I have told you this privately, and I just wanted to say it to you publicly, and, and also when you come up, Dean Houtman. But this is the first time I've really seen such a fabulous collaboration. I mean, yes, your school is new, but it's so wonderful that you guys both care about our whole state, not just your area in the south, not just your area in the north. When you said my colleague and friend, that speaks volumes, my colleague and friend. Collaboration is key. Partnership is critical. We all know as Nevadans that we are bereft in a lot of areas of medicine. And to have the first rheumatologist in a state fellowship of a state with 3.2 million people, and I have arthritis, so thank you. Um, I just, I'm so glad to see you working together. All it's going to do is benefit Nevada. I don't want either of you to ever move again. You just stay right where you are. And um, I, I was at a, uh, something at UNLV, and I told the students, we've got a legislature coming up next year. Make sure your voice is heard because we really need residencies in Nevada. That's why we lose so many doctors. So I, I really hope that this whole group, our, our regents, we have a really concerted effort. And I know it's one of our asks in our budget, but uh, the residencies are key to keeping our doctors. So thank you. And I know we're going to hear from Dean Pontman too, but thank you so much for what you're doing, Dr. Kahn. Thank you, Regent. Thank you, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I, I do think it's such a value. Uh, over the years, it's always been contentious between the North and the South, and I think it's wonderful that you're collaborating. I would like, as we move forward, with the, you know, when you're giving us the details on the practice plan, I'd love to just kind of dig in a little bit more on that so that we can have a little bit more detail. I think it's important for us to um, air it here publicly so everyone can hear what you're doing and see what you're doing, and also we can ask those pertinent questions, and if you're hitting any roadblocks, we can also uh, do that as well. I, I feel like, um, we need to get more of this stuff out in the open and, and talk about you know, some of your challenges as well as, as uh, successes within the practice plan. So um, I just really appreciate you and all the work you do. And I am a supporter. And we're going to do some great stuff. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Regent. Thank Agreed. you. All right, Dr. Hopman, would you please come up and give us a UNR School of Medicine report. Nice uh, to see you. Nice to see you, uh, Regent and uh, Paul, for the record, Paul Houtman, Dean at UNR Med. And I want to thank my partner and friend, Mark Kahn, for his kind comments. 
I'd also like to extend an invitation to everyone to our match day next Friday, uh, March 15th. It's the same time all across the country. We'll be holding ours at the Reno Convention Center. We also have commencement coming uh, May 15th. Our speaker is Dr. Gary Gibbons, who is the director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH. So if I can have the next slide, please. I guess I can, yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm, I plan to give you a uh, number of updates and highlights on strategic planning at the medical school, accreditation. As Dr. Khan mentioned, we are in the same cycle. Uh, how we're doing in terms of the class of 2028, which uh, the recruitment is underway now. We'll spotlight GME research, continuing medical education, Project ECHO. I'll provide some leadership updates, uh, some highlights on philanthropy. Dr. Khan made reference to UNLV collaborations. We can't emphasize that enough. In fact, we have one uh, that is nascent, but we're working together to put uh, a journal for the state um, in collaboration, we hope, with the Nevada uh, State Medical Association. And then an update on the affiliation with Renown Health. So we just finished our strategic planning initiative for 2024 to 2029 in collaboration with uh, colleagues and faculty at the College of Business. We received input from many constituents. Uh, this plan will roll out next week online and we're happy to share, with, share it with the regents at that time. We have four strategic pillars, develop a connected community, promote excellence in education, advance medicine through research and innovation, and build an integrated academic health system with our partner, Renown. Our next steps is to develop specific targets and then implement uh, a plan to achieve those targets. We do have some accreditations upcoming, speech pathology and audiology, a, an important part of the School of Medicine, launched their accreditation process um, in the beginning of February. They get accredited through the Council on Academic Accreditation for Audiology and Speech Language Pathology. Again, Dr. Khan mentioned that we at UNR Med and UNL VMed are on the same cycle with the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, and our visit is also in the fall of 2025, but it's a two-year process and we're well underway uh, in preparing for it. In terms of the class of 2028, we've received 1,731 applicants. We have uh, interviewed about 300 of those applicants. We're also highlighting that for the first time, we are prospectively recruiting uh, students who want to pursue a joint MD and PhD. In terms of graduate medical education, I'm happy to report that we are developing a new OBGYN residency following a rigorous process of assessment with renowned health to ensure long-term viability of the program, accreditation, and funding. And we're currently evaluating five other programs a new rural track for family medicine residency, a surgery residency, cardiovascular medicine fellowship, fellowship in hematology, oncology, and also addiction medicine. Our plan is to have five new programs by 2030. We've done very well in research. This slide highlights some of the big awards that some of our basic scientists have garnered over the last year with over 50 peer-reviewed publications. If you add up all our grants and contracts, excluding clinical trials, Last year, we garnered approximately $39 million uh, worth of support. I'd like to highlight the Nevada State Public Health Lab under the leadership of Dr. Mark Panduri. The lab received recognition by the Centers for Disease Control as the Western U.S. Bioinformatic Regional Resource for Public Health based on the lab's strength in bioinformatics for pathogen genomics. They also published uh, peer-reviewed research articles in high-impact uh, factor journals, including one in Lancet on the Canada Oris outbreak here in southern Nevada, which continues to garner a lot of attention. The $75 million new state-of-the-art laboratory will be built on our campus. It's due to be completed in late 2026. The architectural plans have been completed, and we're expecting uh, groundbreaking in the late spring or early summer. I'd like to highlight continuing medical education. Uh, we are um, really uh, a leader in this area in the state. We accredited uh, nearly 450 uh, programs last year, nearly 1,200 sessions for a total of 2,300 hours of CME. We educated over 13,000 healthcare professional, professionals and issued 25,000 hours of CME. I want to highlight two programs, the first annual Pennington Cancer uh, Institute Conference at Renown Health and the first annual Renown Neuroscience Symposium highlighting the strength of our affiliation with Renown Health. 
And here is a list of some of the CME partnerships we have with institutions in Nevada and outside the state as well. Project ECHO has done extremely well and continues to serve the state. There were almost 260 sessions for 20 unique programs in partnership with the Kerkorian School of Medicine for several of those programs. Uh, Project ECHO delivered 147 case reviews and consultations. We had over 3,600 total attendees and 918 unique attendees to those programs. And we're very proud of the new programming, including those on HPV vaccination and palliative care. Some key leadership updates at UNR Med, Dr. Sam Lee from Dartmouth and the White River Junction VA was hired as chair of internal medicine and will be our new endowed chair, the Manville Chair of Medicine. Dr. Amy McGehey was hired as chair of family and community medicine from Creighton University in Nebraska and she starts, next, uh, she starts April 1st. Uh, Bob Harvey was appointed chair in pharmacology. Dr. Dean Birkin appointed interim chair of physiology and cell biology. And John Westhoff, who was interim chair of internal medicine, has been named assistant dean for student research, which is a big focus for us going forward. We have two big positions that we're hiring for. We have a national search with the search firm underway for a senior associate dean for institutional and faculty affairs and an associate dean for clinical research. In terms of philanthropy, at the end of this past year in December, we were pleased to receive a, a gift of $450,000 from the Nevada Community Foundation to support the hiring of a clinical audiologist, student research, cancer research, and the Springboard Fund, which is designed to help uh, junior investigators uh, in, uh, as they seek their first major fund, a uh, funding uh, opportunity, and a $500,000 grant from the Health Plan of Nevada to improve access to behavioral health services in a joint UNR Med renowned initiative. Uh, we've talked about these collaborations already this morning. I just want to highlight that uh, we had a wonderful time up here at uh, the Kirk Kerkorian School of Medicine. And the photograph on the right, you'll see uh, Chair uh, Goodman, who joined us on that day, uh, along with students from UNLV and UNR Med. In terms of our affiliation with Renown, uh, we've uh, made a lot of progress. We've developed a meaningful participation patient program, which is designed to hold renowned employed physicians accountable for their teaching. We've collaborated on joint leadership hires, as well as an NIH-funded clinical researcher. The renowned leadership will be teaching a business of medicine elective. It's actually next week for fourth-year medical students. Internal medicine grand rounds uh, featured UNR med translational scientists. Our Savit Medical Library has opened a satellite at renowned regional hospital and we have an integrated clinical research office which is functioning well. We have a number of works in progress, the development of new GME programs, an evaluation of simulation education across the UNR uh, and renowned sites and the VA as well. Uh, we have worked on responding to a clear visit by the ACGME, that's the Clinical Learning Environment uh, Review, and we are working on the LCME site visit in 2025 focusing on sufficiency of faculty, protected teaching time, and the learning environment. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions or any comments? Regent Del Carlo. Yes, that very good presentation. On your slide um, 17, the business of medicine, elective for fourth year medical students, I think that's a great idea. That's, is that for, geared to if they want to go into like private practice so they understand they're like, you know, they're in a, the employer and all that kind of, what, what do you cover in that? I mean, it's, a, it's a broad waterfront. This is the first year we're off, sorry, Paul Houtman for the record from UNR Med. Uh, it's it's a uh, sort of a, a survey course, if you will, on all aspects of business uh, in medicine, mostly uh, hospital based and how hospitals run, health systems run. But we're also going to talk about alternative careers and, and other avenues. Um, that are part of medicine. So is this like a, a, a class, a, a it, it's an elective. It's an elective class for graduate, soon to graduate fourth year students. Okay. Um, from personal experience, I can tell you that when I graduated from medical school, I didn't know Medicare from Medicaid from third party payers. I didn't know what a, CM, uh, a chief medical officer did. I didn't understand the C-suite and how a hospital operated. So we're working to close that gap. And is this something like a best practice that other medical schools offer? I mean, you're starting as an elective, right? 
we're starting it as an elective and um, we hope that it grows. I think uh, going forward, what we'd like to do is have some of our students spend time in the C-suite at, at, at Renowned Health, actually spend a day with the CEO, spend a day with the CFO, spend a day with the chief medical officer, just to understand uh, the complexities of running a hospital in 2024 and beyond. I think that's a great idea. And, and could you just explain the CLARE, C-L-E-R visit? It's Clinical Learning Evaluation Review. Right, so uh, Paul Houtman, uh, you and I met for the record. Uh, that is a um, hospital-based review that the accreditation body for GME runs. Um, and it is more about suggesting improvements in the learning environment than uh, a true um, regulatory uh, exercise. Um, and so they came through and they, uh, there were a number of uh, areas for improvement and we're working uh, with the CEO of Renowned Regional specifically to make those improvements in anticipation of a formal accreditation visit which is going to occur uh, in April or May of this year. I just have one last comment. And just as I, you were sitting there when Dean Hop or uh, Dean Kahn was up, but calling him my partner and friend, I, I just think it's wonderful and I agree with our chair that we have a lot of north-south rivalries here in our state, but I'm just so, so pleased to see our medical schools working so well together, and it's due to the leadership. That's where it starts, so thank both of you. Paul Houtman, you and our med dean, for the record, I appreciate those comments. That, you know, at the end of the day, we face a challenge. Nevada's supply of physicians ranks 45th to 49th, depending on the, the discipline, and we have to fix that for the benefit of the state, for the benefit of the people here, and also if we're going to grow uh, as a state. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And just know that we are in support of you. I, we agree. It's it's unacceptable for us to have uh, such a such a low number here in our state. So just know that we are supportive, and I know you know that. But we're gonna we're gonna make some changes. Thank you very Chair much, Chair Goodman. If I oh if yes, I may. yes, just Go ahead, um, Regent for both of the deans, we know that some states are you know declining and. Uh, population, California, New York, and a few others, wouldn't that be a, a matter of, I'm trying to think out of it, for our GMEs, our state is growing. We need to find out, and I think through Chair Goodman, that we will be able to figure out how do we get our federal delegation, and I know you work with them, to make sure that they understand how important this is with a growing state and not a state that's diminishing. So I think if we all work together on that, it's something that has to change. And the quicker the better. I mean, um, getting a surgery done nowadays. I mean, an anesthesiologist is a field that is dissipating instead of growing. And so it, it's really becoming crucial. And hopefully through not only this organization of NG and uh, leadership with CHAIR, that all of us together, that we can make an invisible line that north and south. I grew up here, and the only thing should be competitive is maybe sports. But other than that, we should all want to have a better state. And uh, between the two of you, I feel like this has been a big difference, and I also appreciate that. Thank you, Paul Houtman, for the record at UNR Med. I'll just make a comment that from the standpoint of federal support, there hasn't been a demonstrable increase in funding for GME since 1997. <laughs> And we have been in touch with uh, the federal delegation. Um, we're also working diligently at the state level to garner more support. I think it's going to take uh, state support. It will take philanthropy. And it will take the hospitals stepping forward to support GME. Uh, pay now, and you, the benefits will, will accrue over time. Thank you very much, Dean. Up. Regent Goodman. Oh, sorry. Yes, Regent Arascada. Thank you. If I can, um, this question is going to be headed out to both the deans, Dean Kahn and Dean Hotman. I was just curious about looking at the both of the presented material. There seems to be a disproportionate number of Nevada applicants to Nevada acceptance um, in each for each med school. Um, looking at Dean Hotman's, there's 1,731 applicants with. Uh, the number from Nevada is only 272 of those applicants. And then over at UNLV, the number seems to be a little bit lower with Nevada residents of 225. Out of the numbers that you all have, both approximately 1,700 applicants apiece, how many Nevada residents 
are being accepted to the programs? Uh, Percentage-wise. Uh, for, for the record, Paul Houtman, Dean at UNR Med, uh, approximately 90% of our matriculated students are Nevada State residents. Mark Kahn, for, for the record, 99%, um, nearly all of our students are Nevada residents. And, and I will highlight that with the physician shortage, uh, we, we should keep in mind that if we can attract students from, from California and neighboring states, they spend some time here in the state. They may decide, this is where I want to live going forward. So, we, we, and, and the same thing applies for graduate medical education. I have no issue with uh, recruiting individuals from the outside. The data are very clear that the retention is much higher when an individual uh, completes their residency or fellowship program in the state. With the number of applicants that you all have, and this is something down the road, and I'm sure it's going to present, I'm presenting this to both the two of you and also to the presidents. What are the odds of increasing the classes, the cohort numbers? Mark Kahn, for the record. Thank you, Regent. Um, we, at our next accreditation visit, uh, plan to ask for, we need permission to go up more than 10%. We've already gone up 10% this past year, but we intend to uh, ask for a class size of 90 uh, to do that, we're going to need an increase in the number of faculty. Uh, we were fortunate to receive some state funding to do that at the last legislative session, and we're now in the process of hiring somewhere around 80 faculty. And then we think we'll be in a really good position to do that. But you do raise a good point. The number of Nevada applicants is not really that large, and I'll let my colleague speak because I know he does the same thing in the north, but uh, if you saw one of my earlier slides, I showed you the number of outreach programs that we actually have, and you need to reach into the community early. If you wait for college to get uh, folks interested in careers in healthcare and medicine particularly, it's too late. So we're in the high schools, we're in the junior high schools, and we have uh, really stepped up our efforts uh, to talk about careers in healthcare because you're absolutely spot on. We need a bigger pipeline to be able to make an impact. Uh, for the record, Paul Houtman, uh, UNR Med Dean. Uh, I agree with uh, Dean Kahn. We have pathway programs as, as well at UNR. But I do think that uh, the growth of GME is the, is the biggest issue uh, facing us right now. Uh, with upcoming accreditation and sufficiency of faculty uh, an issue, uh, we're going to hold, uh, hold at 70 uh, without going up. Uh, we do have a little bit of leeway, of, uh, plus or minus 10%. Um, but and we may we may take advantage of that on the plus side, but I think first and foremost we have to grow GME, and once that happens, our students will are much more likely to stay in the state for their training. Do you want to give your data? Wonderful. And one last question, if I may, Regent Goodman. Yes, go ahead. Is there an emphasis on applicant acceptance for those committed to the rural counties? Uh, for the record, Paul Houtman, you and our med. Can you just repeat uh, that question, uh, Regent? Applicants who make a commitment to practice in the rural, com rural counties or rural communities, is there a greater emphasis of acceptance to each of the programs? Thank you for that question, uh, Regent. Paul Houtman, you and our med dean. Uh, right now, uh, we certainly... Uh, look favorably on individuals who state they want to practice in rural communities and uh, students who come from rural communities because they're much more likely to understand the challenges of medical care in those communities. Uh, we also have a program that uh, UNR Med runs uh, for loan repayment, uh, loan forgiveness, if you will, for service in rural communities. And we believe that that's, uh, that's an avenue to help uh, populate our clinics and hospitals in the rurals. Uh, when a student commits, uh, many year, it'll be many years before they're actually in practice. They have four years of medical school and then a minimum of three years of residency, and life happens. And so a commitment made um, at the time of matriculation to medical school is one thing, but uh, loan repayment and, and really approaching our residents later in their training, uh, I think, is, a, is a, a formula for success in populating, uh, as I said, uh, healthcare facilities um, in our rural regions. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Khan to address that. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the record, Mark Kahn, um, you know, I, th this is a critical need for our state. Um, aside from where the two of us live, we're predominantly a, a rural state. Um, we're uh, uh, talking about such programs. We don't have one now, but I will tell you, we do uh, sponsor a rural family medicine residency program in Winnemucca. Um, and I think that we need to, again, this is something that uh, Dean Hauptman and I need to collectively work on because it is an issue. It is an issue. And he's spot on correct that uh, to get a student interested in rural uh, health, your best effort is to get uh, folks that are from rural communities. That's, that's the way that it works. And that's national data supports that. Thank you. Regent Brager. Thank you. Um, Dean Kahn, you, you answered or shared what I was going to ask, but I want to emphasize on it. Do you go to, like in the South, I can only speak to, um, the career technical academies that have the medical aspect of teaching? Um, and is it a one-time visit? And I guess my thought is when they're, normally people know they want to be a doctor a lot of times. I mean, they could be in middle school, high school. Whether they fulfill it or not is another thing. How much interaction can our 11th and 12th graders get with either medical school, quite frankly, because some do go up to the north because they want to go to school outside of where they've lived forever. Is that something we can dig into more or we can have more visits or more commitment to those? Not that we don't go to other campuses, but those are specifically students that go there for that reason. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark Kahn, for the record. Uh, thank you, Regent, for that question. We do, uh, we are pretty heavily involved with those schools and some others. Um, the only thing I'm going to just say as a clarification is we have to really reach, high schools are great, but it actually, decisions sometimes are made earlier than that. Last night, uh, we had a panel discussion uh, of black physicians. And, you know, what is really clear is that you got to get to folks early. Um, and, you know, that's why we do reach out into junior high schools and even before that if we can. And if we're going to increase... Uh, the diversity of our health care workforce, which we need to do. Uh, we need to be in the high schools, but we need to start before that as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Dean. Uh, uh, Paul Hauptman, for the record, um, I, 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 will, uh, I completely agree with Dean Kahn. I will also add that we have a very successful post-bac program, post-baccalaureate, because there are students who go through college and the university experience, uh, go into the real world, and then decide they, they, they really want to go to medical school. And we have pathways for them to get into medical school, and it's been actually quite successful. So I think it's both ends of the spectrum, if you will. Everything from high school to following college and university, and uh, realization that medicine is a calling sometimes occurs later than earlier. Thank you for that, and I really appreciate it. I think what we... Something that we need to work on, and I 100% agree on the seventh, eighth graders, but I believe we need to teach those that think they can't, that they can. Absolutely. And that's the biggest problem is that economically and fiscally, they feel like they can't and it's in their head. And that's something that we need to teach that they can. And I think we need some type of interaction that lets students that are maybe in a um, situation that they just can't think beyond that, but they have the IQ, the intelligence, the will, and the desire, and that's going to take something more from all of us, not just um, the two of you, but I appreciate what you're doing across the state, and we just need to make sure that we dig deeper. Our state's not going to get any smaller, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Brager. Go ahead, Dean. At risk of overstaying uh, our welcome, uh, Paul Houtman, you and our Ned, um, just want to highlight that in terms of uh, our tuition, our two schools uh, rank at the bottom, which is where you want to be, um, in terms of the pu public medical schools in the WICHE system. Uh, I looked at the statistics recently, tuition alone, you and our Med is, ranks 15th out of 18th, and if you look at tuition plus fees, 16th out of 18th. So it is in a, relatively speaking, relative to the other schools, it's uh, an affordable option. Admittedly, uh, too expensive, and we're always looking for scholarship aid and, and other uh, avenues of support for our students. And thank you to both of you. Thank you. And I have to, one more thing to say, Deans. I, I think your, uh, your, your percentage, 40%, 
of students that go to college or university here stay, 60% of those that go to medical school stay, 80% of those who have a residency stay, and I think that speaks volumes. Yeah, Paul Hatman, just the, the, the data, and it comes from John Packham in the Office of Statewide Initiatives, uh, medical school graduates 40% stay, residency 60%, but if they do their medical school and residency, okay. 80%. Thank you, thank you for clarifying thank you. that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to item number six, our UNLV School of Medicine, community outreach. Dr. Ma, is he here? Hi, doctor. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman, uh, regents, um, um, colleagues, and members of the public. Uh, James Ma, last name is M-A-H for the record. I'm Interim Dean at UNLV School of Dental Medicine. I'm here today to talk about our community outreach efforts. The School of Dental Medicine has been open for 22 years on a strategic mission of dental education and care for the diversity of our community. It's woven into our fabric from the very beginning. And indeed, when we survey the students that enter or choose to come to UNLV School of Dental Medicine, the most common reason they choose to come is our opportunities for community engagement. Sorry, I'm stuck on the advance here. Green arrow? There you go. There it is. Thank you. We have two categories of community outreach, those that we provide service, and we cater to those that are uninsured or underinsured. So these clinics are low cost to no cost to a diverse group of populations. The other category of effort is preventive, community outreach initiatives focused on education and prevention. We look forward to a world where kids grow up without ever having to have a cavity or a cavity filled. And that's an ambitious goal and we have a lot of work to do. On the community service clinics, we have five free community outreach clinics. One was started by one of our students who is a member of a Gold Star family. Started in 2007, this clinic offers no-cost dental care to veterans. It's hosted eight to nine times a year, and to this date has provided care to more than 515 people. We also have a women's clinic started in 2011. This clinic is held six times each year and has completed over 1,600 no-cost procedures. Children's clinic. Again, started in 2011, this clinic is now available three to four days each week and has provided more than 12,000 procedures. We also have the Smiles Dental Clinic. Throughout the year, our faculty and students provide dental treatment to more than 1,000 at-risk youth and 200 homeless adults. Another one is our Give Kids a Smile, which is a national event. This is staffed by volunteers. And uh, we take care of dozens of kids during that event every year. On the community outreach initiatives, this is the preventive part of it. We continue with our efforts on the crackdown in cancer. It's still a big effort. Uh, smoking, tobacco cessation has somewhat been taken over by uh, vaping and so forth. So it remains a problem for oral health care. Seal Nevada South is also another effort. I'll give more details in a minute. And our Early Childhood Caries Prevention Project. The Crackdown on Cancer, again, is a prevention program. It's to educate people on the harmful effects of tobacco products. And we've given information to more than 170,000 middle and high school students, recognizing this is generally where it starts. If we can inform them early on and particularly now with vaping, ever more so important, they get information about the harm of these things sooner than later. Um, more than 78,000 high school students received full ne head, neck, and intraoral cancer screenings. This is a map where 
I think it's a very informative map to show where some of these activities occur. And you can see that we've got pretty good coverage, although there's still room to expand to other counties in Nevada. The estimated value of this care is at 3.8 million. Another very active and ongoing program is SEAL Nevada South. It was initially funded by a grant from Oral Health America. This is to provide the broad spectrum of oral education or hygiene instruction, uh, sealants, uh, varnishes, and so forth to the very young. These are the second and third grade students at underprivileged schools within the Clark County District. Uh, it's a unique population because this may be the first time these uh, young individuals have ever encountered a dentist or anybody from the health care at all. So it's a very um, vulnerable and unique part of our population. <coughs> We've expanded that program. It now goes to even the younger age, to the pre-fifth grade students in Title I CCSD schools and in rural southern Nevada. Um, during 2023, the state's Department of Health and Human Services uh, Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy gave us uh, about 182,000 to expand the program. So we continue to do more than we've ever done in community engagement. The new funding will allow us to do 13 more schools and interact with 1,400 more young students. Uh, we continue with this as well, the Early Carries Prevention Program. Originally was a three-year project, and we continue to go ahead and um, strengthen that effort. This uh, provides biannual oral health care sc screenings and um, varnishes at early Head Start and, and Head Start centers. Uh, we've reached approximately 67 locations throughout Nevada. And just looking at the numbers, you get a sense that it's a team, it's a big team, and I take a minute to acknowledge our faculty, our dedicated staff, and the students that go out, often driving their own vehicles and so forth, to get to these areas uh, of need. Uh, the impact has been huge. Uh, from 2011 to present, 28,000 screenings, over 14,000 sealants, 23,000 fluoride treatments, and if we look at the average cost value using the American Dental Association fee guide, what people would be charged if they went to a dentist, the value to the community is approximately $7.4 million. We're in a state where you don't have to look very far to find a group that has oral need. I'm gonna share with you two of the new future ones, but it doesn't stop there. You'll probably hear in the upcoming uh, weeks and months are collaborations more with, with medicine, collaborations with uh, CSN and so forth. This is one that we're, uh, is, is very unique. It's a different population. This one has to do with youth. There's a very unfortunate problem right now and I heard um, Regent Brager talk about cants earlier. This is one of those areas where youth are told they can't participate because of the requirement for a mouth guard which they cannot afford. And we know that in this population, often sports and athleticism is their ticket to a better life. And they're denied that because of a mouth guard. So through volunteers, corporate and individual funding, we plan to mount a mouth guard program <laughs> where it's at no cost. To, and it's not just a lower portion or lower level of mouth guard. We, on the other hand, have worked with the School of Engineering to pioneer some of the best mouth guard technologies that's attracted attention from professional sports teams. These youth will get the same level of mouth guard. The workshops we're leveraging are digital technologies to do the scanning, the 3D printing, and then we customize the mouth guard for that individual so they have pride in wearing it to increase collaboration and participation to actually wear the mouth guard, which is a secondary problem when they're fitted with uh, oversized or unfitted uh, mouth guards. Um, this is part of uh, UNLV's um, Health Department of Sports Medicine, so it's not isolated to looking at just the teeth. C concussion, other types of athletic injuries are, are part of it. And not to 
underscore this problem, but we also look at this demographic and we know that some take a risk without oral protection. And when there's an injury, the injuries are exceedingly costly that they exceed the monthly income for the family. And next thing you know, the kids are taken out of that sport, which is their passion. And it comes to mind, there's a saying about idle time and youth that I think we're all familiar with. We don't want them to go down that path. We want them to excel with the um, aptitude and the interest that they have. So this one, as you're probably hearing from me, is definitely a, a passion of mine, and we have ongoing meetings about that. Another future program is what's happening around us. We are one of the most favored states for veterans to retire. Alongside with that is their need for health care, including dental care. We're hearing wait lists for their dental operation at the VA, 12 to 18 months for a dental appointment is unacceptable. That pretty much for some problems is no care. We hope to collaborate with the VA to share resources, to share our physical space, to share our students, um, faculty along with the, their faculty so we can open up our doors to see more veterans. We also have access to very specific items that the VA does not have, such as access to oral pathology services, dental anesthesiology, and high-end oral radiology services. So I think it'll be a great partnership. It's still in the very early stages, but I hope to be back at another time to report progress and more success on these initiatives. I will close to say that there are many. There weren't enough time or slides to add. We want to take care of the entire community, ranging from the infants. Uh, cleft palate is another topic you'll hear more about. There's only two states in the United States that have no cleft palate clinic, and that is Alaska and Nevada. Every other state has care for infants born with cleft lip and cleft palate, yet we, we don't have anything. We want to start that effort going. Another aspect is the geriatric population, which is another very underserved population. Again, we're also a very big retirement place, and particularly for those that are in assisted living, uh, dental care is exceedingly lacking. So that's just a little... Um, color to some of the community engagement efforts. We recognize that we have a lot of work ahead, but at this early part, when we have ongoing efforts, but at this juncture, I'm here to report that we have a lot in our plans and we want to, with everybody's support, continue to take better care of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dean Ma. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, just quickly, have you coordinated with, I mean, we have so many professional sports here now with the mouth guard program. Are you working with the Raiders and the Golden Knights or to, for them to help fund or do some work there? Indirectly, through UNLV Sports Medicine, we have a, a line into uh, Golden Knights. Um, in fact, tomorrow afternoon, I have a meeting with um, a professional lacrosse team to talk about that everybody, so far the ones that we've talked to are indeed very supportive of this effort. I think it's an easy sell to see the potential for oral protection in, in youth because it just brings so much more to the table and it brings out, like I said, a lot of people that wouldn't normally have access to participation in sports. But yes, it, it and if, you, like if anybody fit. has connections, I <laughs> yeah. very much welcome those type of connections. Thank great, you. Great, and thank you for all the good work you're doing in our community. Uh, for decades, uh, I don't know, there, there's always been this great need. I've been aware of it, and you're just really tackling it. So thank you so much. Uh, do we have any comments from, from the board? Go ahead, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Goodman. Regent Del Carlo, for the record. How much are you talking for a mouth guard? I mean, to go and get it fitted, and et cetera. Um, James Ma, you know, I'm still dental medicine for the record. A uh, professional mouth guard for a dentist um, is typically around $500 with the appointments, the impression, the, the lab fee, and, and so forth. Now, there are for professional teams more custom designs that e exceed over $1,000 each. Thank you. And one other question, if I may, or... Um, I think I mentioned this maybe before you were the acting dean, but dental dental care is, is 
you know, we all have to have it. And uh, I know, I think the South is very, very fortunate to have a dental school here. We don't have anything like that outside of Clark County, but uh, up North, we had a vet pass away because he didn't have the money for dental care. And a group of citizens up North got together and started this adopt a vet dental program. And it's been wildly successful. And President Sandoval's shaking his head. He knows about it. And so what they did, I mean, there's got to be thousands of dentists in private practice in Las Vegas. And what this group did was go to the dentists and ask each dentist to take on one vet, just one. We're just asking for one to do pro bono work. And then I was part of a group that did fundraising every year to pay for the... Um, uh, lab fees and those kinds of things. And the program has been wildly successful because we don't have access to a dental school or clinics or anything like that. So, I mean, I'd be happy to get with you later and um, put you in contact. I mean, it's just another idea because you're right. There's a lot of people that want to move here. The weather's, look at the weather today. I'm, I'm facing a blizzard at my house. Um, why wouldn't I want to be here? So, um, but there's things we can do when we know there's a problem. There's ways to fix them so and just expand. But thank you for all you do. I'm mean, so impressed when I, I, I urge all the regents. I took the time to um, visit the dental school, spend like a day there with Dean Lily Garcia. She's gone now, but uh, it, it's wonderful what you're doing. So thank you Great. for your presentation and wonderful. your work. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more comments? Okay, well, Dean Ma, thank you thank so you. much for all you do. Um, uh, we're coming up on our, our our time, and I'm going to be calling up the next item, but I'd like to just put on the record that this committee doesn't meet that often, and I, I think we should be allowed an hour and a half <laughs> instead of having a hard stop time at 10. Um, we, we've barely spoken, but there's so much, uh, such a wealth of information that we're getting here. Um, I would just like to put that on the record for a request moving forward. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to item... Okay, we'll move on to item number seven, uh, our NC Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for our, um, our SAMHSA grant. Uh, I have Dr. Muscudi. Hello, doctor, how are you? Thank Good. you for being here. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you so much to the regents to the presidents, the chancellor, and cabinet members. My name is Dr. Marinela Mascuti, and I'm the mental health wellness officer for the NCHI System Administration Office. My role as a mental health wellness officer is a newly introduced grant-funded position that was implemented by NCHI to oversee the utilization of the SAMHSA Mental Health Grant. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present information about this grant and the ways that it's supporting mental health for our institutions. I'd like to begin by providing an overview of what the grant is about, as well as a description of the grant deliverables. In September of 2022, the NCHI System Administration was awarded a $2.66 million federal grant from SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, to address the mental health needs of our institutions. The initial timeline of the grant was scheduled to conclude in September of 2023. However, the one-year timeline was not nearly enough to support the scope of work for all the institutions. So to address this issue, NCHI submitted a request for a no-cost grant extension for, to provide additional timeline to complete the grant. The request was approved by SAMHSA, and the timeline of the grant was extended to conclude until March of 2024. Now, while I was directly responsible for overseeing the overall administration of the grant, I wasn't brought on to oversee the institution's scope of work until five months following the initial award of this grant. There were some challenges along the way. However, I was fortunate to receive additional support and guidance from members of the Mental Health Task Force, who I work with directly, as well as the co-chairs, Dr. Yanni Dickens from UNR and Dr. Jamie Davidson from UNLV, who's here today to assist with any additional questions you might have for the institution later on. I'd like to say that this mental health grant is unique because it serves as the first opportunity for NCHI to not only assess the mental health needs and the support of our students, but it also allowed us to take the opportunity to assess the needs of our frontline providers, our faculty and staff for each of the institutions. 
The grant is also important because it provides the opportunity to allow us to essentially support various mental health training for mental health first aid, as well as suicide awareness and prevention, which I'll talk more about soon. I'd like to clarify that the amount of funds that were administered to each of the institutions were based on their specific number of enrolled students, faculty and staff, as well as their various requests for programming in mental health. While DRI was an institution that did not receive a subaward for the grant, they were invited to partake in trainings for mental health first aid and suicide awareness and prevention. The additional funds that were utilized by ENCHI also supported the funding of contracts, training, as well as salaries of staff who assisted with the coordination of this grant. Now the assigned grant deliverables for NC's system administration office primarily focused on hiring the mental health wellness officer who's responsible for overseeing the administration of the grant as well as the conclusion of the grant deliverables. The subawards that were received by each of the NC institutions provided the opportunity to support various grant deliverables in mental health. While the scope of work for the institutions varied, overall, for the most part, they provided funds to assist with hiring of supporting staff. They also supported with implementation of training programs for mental health. They also supported with funding teaching, teaching supplies and materials that the institutions use. And they also assisted with funding conferences and direct student services like Christie Campus Health, Better Mind, and Together All. These direct student services were especially helpful for some of the institutions that currently do not offer resources for mental health. The services that were offered, either through Christie Campus Health or Better Mind or Together All, essentially provided a 24-7 mental health support line, and it also provided the opportunity to create an online student communication platform that provided peer support in mental health. Keep in mind, these resources are only available for the duration of the grant. Now, as Enchi's as Enchi's mental health and wellness officer, as well as the recent alumni of UNLV, I'd like to state that I am very grateful for the opportunity to support and guide the work of our mental health task force, as well as the grant that we received for mental health. In addition to supervising the utilization of these funds, I was also responsible for establish establishing institutional relationships, as well as institutional on-site visits, and of course, various contractual agreements that were required to implement our survey, as well as the mental health trainings. Overall, as I've served in this role, I've learned that it's important to have a position for a mental health wellness officer because essentially it's, it served as a significant point of contact for the task force and the institutions, and it's also served as a direct communication line for the institutions to the system administration office. This position did not exist before. Should there have been any questions or concerns related to mental health or the grant, the institution could, you, could directly reach out to me, and then I was able to assess and address those questions directly with our leadership staff within the system administration office. So now that we've had an overview of the grant, let's take a look at some of the training programs that is supported. Training for mental health first aid were individually offered by each of the institutions to teach participants about mental health and substance abuse concerns. While a majority of the participants that partook in this training received the general overview training for mental health first aid, some of the faculty and staff utilized the grant funds to essentially complete an extended training that certified them to teach mental health first aid in future training courses on campus. In addition to funding the mental health first aid training, and she also established a partnership with Living Works, who's a training vendor that provides information and resources and training for suicide awareness and prevention. All of the training that we provided that were offered to all of the participants were offered at no additional charge, and they were offered to the ENCHI students, faculty, and staff alike. Anybody that partook in the training, they were also available to receive a certification as well as CEU credits for any of the professions that required it. Now I'd like to further clarify living works training. The available living works that, trainings that were offered included three different types. The first one is the online learning platform called START, and the other two are in-person training workshops that were called either a safe talk or assist. Now the benefits of the online START program is that it served as a self-paced 60-minute online training that participants could complete on their own time. 
this was essentially helpful for anyone that maybe didn't have enough time to provide more of the in-depth training. The benefits of the in-person Safe Talk and Assist workshop was that it provided participants an opportunity to engage in person and learn more about you know, an overview of what it means to effectively respond and provide resources to persons who are either struggling with suicidal thoughts or suicide attempts. As of today, I'm happy to report that the Mental Health Grant has trained almost 3,000 participants, and that includes students, faculty, and staff who are now equipped to address not only mental health first aid, but also suicide awareness and prevention at each of our NSHE institutions. In addition to funding training courses, the grant also supported the administration of the mental health assessment. In partnership with Ipsos, who is a survey vendor, and she utilized the grant fund to launch a system-wide survey to better understand and determine the mental health needs of our NSHE community system-wide. Now the questions on this survey were aimed to assess the current state of our mental health services within the NSHE system, but it also helped to identify the specific mental health needs and challenges that are faced by our NSHE population. Additionally, the survey was also beneficial because it helped us understand the utilization and the effectiveness of existing mental health resources at each of our campuses. And it also assisted with potentially evaluating any gaps and areas for future improvements. So let's take a look at some of the survey responses and also let's review a summary of some of the reported feedback. When the survey first launched on May 1st of 2023, a total of 109,591 students, faculty, and staff were initially invited to complete the survey until June 2nd of 2023. To encourage a greater number of completed surveys, the initial time frame of this grant was extended by an additional week, allowing participants to complete the survey until June 9th of 2023. Overall, there was a 6% participation rate with a total of 6,349 completed surveys. It's important to note that due to the timing constraints of this grant and the funds that were provided by the grant, the survey was launched during the conclusion of the spring semester timeframe. This may have been a contributing factor to the survey's low response rate, as you may, as you may see. However, regardless of any concerns for the survey's low response rate, it's important to note that this survey is significant because it's really provided the opportunity for NSHE to initially and to begin ensuring that the Board of Regents, the system administration, as well as our campus leadership begin to understand what are those existing needs for mental health. And hopefully we can use this survey as a tool to plan and respond accordingly to all of the mental health concerns that we continue to hear about. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the survey results. As you can see, overall 60% of survey respondents stated that they feel stressed out, anxious, worried, or overwhelmed either often or all the time. And this is across our system. While 64% believe that mental health is important to their institutions, and 68% reported that they often search for information on how to improve their mental health, 82% strongly stated that mental health is something that NSHE and the institution should be directly involved in. Unfortunately, as you can see, only 37% of respondents believe that enough is being done right now to address the current mental health concerns on our campus. Now, when we analyze the current state of training and communication, all of the responding faculty and staff reported that they're interested in receiving information and resources to better support their students' mental health. Additionally, over 96% of responding faculty and staff are interested in receiving training that will help them to identify and support their students' mental health needs. So, should there be any new or additional training opportunities that are offered to our, to our faculty and staff for mental health? The top three reported categories that they'd like to look into includes financial wellness, mental health first aid, which we begin to support, and of course, the management of stress, depression, and anxiety. 
While all of the responding employees indicated that they were more likely to learn about training and services either online or through their institution's website, it's important to know that 49% explained or reported that the lack of training or available training or the uncertainty of available services prevented them from assisting students on campus. As you can see, this further highlights our employees' request for more effective communication, but also more resources in mental health. Now, an analysis of the institution's access to mental health services was another reported concern that may be hindered by the lack of information and awareness. While 64% of respondents conducted an, conducted an online search for mental health services, and 40% utilized their institution's website to learn more about what's available to them, 49% also reported that not being sure what services were available on campus prevented or delayed them from seeking mental health services. So if we have those resources, it's important that we look into addressing how to more appropriately communicate them. Now, should campuses expand or potentially introduce new mental health services, it's important that they focus on prioritizing effective communication and awareness among our campuses. Additionally, should the institution be able to expand or provide new mental health services, then they should consider looking into the following resources as it has been reported in the survey. And those are individual therapy sessions, in-person therapy sessions, self-help tools as well as mobile apps, walk-in counseling sessions, and of course, informal talking sessions with counselors on campus. Now for the record, I'd like to, to note a typo in the first statement of this slide. As you can see, instead of NC system administrators, it should say NC students. So overall, NC students rated the service they experienced through their institutions high across the spectrum. However, there were a couple of variances that were noted, which were primarily driven by institutions that don't currently offer resources in mental health. While a majority are reporting an overall positive experience, it's also important to note that only 31% of respondents feel that their needs are being met by existing mental health services. So when we analyze possible improvements that were requested for existing services in mental health, respondents stated that they'd like to see more accessible mental health services either online or in person. Additionally, they would like to, re they would like to see services for individual and group therapy sessions as well. So now that you've received a brief summary of the survey results, let's review the following recommendations made by the Mental Health Task Force. For the continuation of support in mental health, the task force would like to encourage ENCHI to prioritize the following key areas. It's important to consider collaboration, consistency, community, communication and leadership when we are addressing mental health. By prioritizing a commitment to mental health at the leadership level, it encourages a continuing commitment system-wide. And it also ignites a culture of support throughout the whole ENCHI community. Additionally, by facilitating collaboration and communication across our institutions, it increases accountability of our staff and leadership, as well as awareness for institutional challenges and it also encourages a consistency of support, not only for funding, but also for resources that are continually required in mental health. Now, as then she continues and recognizes the support for mental health, I'd like to recommend the following actionable items by our mental health task force. First, the Mental Health Task Force would like to request that it becomes a permanent organization of ENSHI with direct communication and reporting capability to the Board of Regents as well as ENSHI's system administration office. Second, the task force would also like to encourage the continuation of mental health training for all of ENSHI's students, faculty, and staff. By offering additional trainings in mental health, we are essentially empowering our faculty and staff and educating them to appropriately respond to any mental health related issues and concerns on campus. Education is key for advocacy and empowerment of our faculty and staff. 
And last but not least, one of the greatest barriers that prevent institutions from adequately supporting mental health is the shortage of financial support. While the SAMHSA Mental Health Grant has served as a great first step in funding some of the institution's mental health services, the remainder of the available funds of this grant will conclude at the end of March. Additionally, any of the institutions that rely on their own financial resources to support their growing needs for mental health, all of them fear that it may soon run out. So, with this concern in mind, the task force would like to request that NSHE includes a funding request to support the mental health programming, resources, and funding at their next upcoming state budget priorities. Thank you so much for your time. I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. And let's keep the questions brief, everyone. We can always reconvene afterwards, but go ahead, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. And I know in item number 21 on our board, main board agenda, Interim Chancellor Charlton is going to be giving a presentation on our budget building. And in there on slide 10, it's part of the governor's three-year plan priority for mental or health and wellness. And then on slide 14, you show mental health at 4.9 million. So my question, even though this is on two different agendas, but to your point with the request, is that 4.9 million going to help extend this grant or put money, if the grant runs out, we don't have this grant, because I truly, truly believe we need to address mental health in all of our campuses. Great, so thank you for the record, um, Chancellor Charlton. And so thank you so much, um, Regent Del Carlo, for that question. So first, um, as you noted, the Governor Lombardo has established health and wellness as a top priority for the state. And then the, um, the request that we have lined out is the initial input that we receive through our campus budget hearings, and that would be a state funding request. We can't extend or add to the existing grant because of the sunset, but we do know that mental health is very, very important. I'm just coming from the Safety and Security Committee, and, and we know that all of this is wrapped up together. So yes, so we will be presenting first tomorrow a high-level overview of the mental health, uh, or all the budget priorities of which mental health is one, and then we'll continue to dive deeper into what those details would look like for, um, for the budget request that you will ultimately approve for the 2025 session. And just a follow-up question. So with, if within that, uh, Chancellor, are you looking to have this position in that $4.9 million at the NC cabinet, or not cabinet, but in, within your purview of reports? We're looking through the details of the best placement and then also the strategic direction. So we know that mental health is important from a system-wide perspective and to support all of the institutions. And so I want to work together with, with obviously... Na Dr. Nayla is who I call her, um, with her, Dr. Archer, and the team on that. But yes, we know that staffing and coordination is one of the most priorities, the highest okay. priorities. Great, because I, I don't want to see you go away. <laughs> I think we need you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. I actually work in the mental health space with uh, gambling addiction and what you do is very important. Uh, most importantly, I hate to see any kind of suicide awareness training or any kind of um, suicide awareness um, uh, resources go away. And so I think that's incredibly important as we move forward because it is sadly much more prevalent than uh, it should be in our state. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to new business. Are there any suggested items uh, for new business uh, at the new, any of our future meetings? Seeing none, we will move forward to public comment. Uh, is there any public comment at Great Basin? No public comment in Elko. Okay, is there any public comment in Reno? None in Reno. Thank you. Uh, any public comment here at DRI? None. Uh, SES, is there any public comment on the phone, please? There is none at this time. Thank you. Thank you all for your time today, and I apologize for us going late, but the meeting is now adjourned.